So very good morning to all, all of you. It's a great pleasure in welcoming all of you for yet another CPD webinar program organized by Sri Knowledge Academy. To have, today we have got a very quite interesting topic, which is coronary artery CTA, a case-based learning by Dr. Anton Marianayagam, consultant radiologist DJ Shmulidhi. Before we move into our routine lecture, let me remind all of you regarding our housekeeping rules. The webinar link will be available until 9.50 a.m. for anyone to join in. No late attendees will be entertained thereafter. Uh, each attendee should have been attended until the end of the webinar to obtain the certificate to CPD points, and the CPD points are strictly adhered to the CPD guidance, as you all know. You will instantly receive the certificate once you fill the Google form. Find use format initials followed by surname. Don't use prefix doctor, for example. This is to improve and maintain the standards of the CPD programs conducted by the SHRI. So there will be a question and answer session towards the end of the webinar. So for any questions and queries, please drop it in the chat functions so they can and also change the chat settings to all panelists and attendees so they can be seen and answered towards the end of the webinar. If you have any very specific questions regarding the situation, you can always email us uh, on office 13 at gmail.com. We also encourage you to uh, keep yourself on mute and uh, turn off the video during the lecture to avoid any unnecessary disturbance. To all the participants today, we have a very special announcement to make. Shri, Society of Health Research and Innovation, has been in the forefront of continuous professional development of medical officers in Sri Lanka. Shri Knowledge Academy, the CPD program, we started way back in January 2022 and is now very popular among all categories of medical officers. It is probably the first ever CPD program in Sri Lanka that provided Sri Lankan doctors clinical updates on a weekly basis. Today, we mark 143rd milestone of our CPD program. I'm sure that this is going to be a very special news for all of you. The ETNR, Unit of Ministry of Health Sri Lanka, has taken an initiative to provide you with a very important, valid CPD certificate to all the CPD followers of accredited CPD program. So I'm very happy to inform that all followers of Sri Knowledge Academy who have received the CPD certificates are eligible to get this important certificate. Please find the relevant link in the ministry website and apply it before the due date. So uh, without further delay, let's move into our a lecture of the day, which is coronary artery CT, a case-based learning by Dr. Anton Maria Nayagam, consultant radiologist, uh, DJ Chmoledi. Although many of you might have known him, let me give a very brief introduction. Uh, he completed his undergraduate education in Faculty of Medicine, University of Jaffna in 2009, and completed his in-service training in radiology in Columbia Group of Hospitals and Kandy National Hospital. <laughs> He completed his overseas training in the New Cross Hospital, Royal Wolverhampton Hospital, and NHS Trust UK, and one year of clinical radiology fellowship with special interest in cardiac CT and cardiac MRI, participated in cardiac imaging courses, accredited by the British Society of Cardiovascular Imaging and Royal College of Radiologists. He has obtained his fellowship from the Royal College of Radiologists. So, uh, among his interests are cardiac imaging, including fetal echocardiography and vascular imaging, he has involved in cardiac imaging and integration of the cardiac radiology in the healthcare system for the last two years in Sri Lanka. So with that introduction, let's move to uh, the lecture of the, lecture of the day, Coronary Artery CTA, a case-based learning. Over to you, dear sir. Thank you, Pastor. Uh, now I am sharing the uh, screen with you. Good morning. Uh, today our topic is uh, Coronary Artery CT Angiogram. Uh, we are aware of uh, various uh, CT angiograms which we use to image uh, uh, vascular beds of various organs or limbs. So uh, the coronary artery CT angiogram differs from other CT angiogram because we are going to image tiny vessels which are uh, embedded in a moving organ. The, so it is quite difficult because wh whatever the movement we get during the CT, they generate artifact. Uh, and uh, so for coronary CT angiogram, there are special protocols, special softwares, and special requirements. And uh, this coronary CT angiogram, in the meantime, is emerging a kind of a promise in the cardiac imaging even to manage the acute chest pain. Uh, until a couple of years ago, coronary CT angiogram and uh, uh, cardiac CT were mainly used to manage uh, stable chest pain patients or chronic chest pain patients. 
with uh, intermediate uh, risk category. Uh, but now there are reviews of uh, many studies done in uh, thousands of patients, which are giving us uh, promising results about uh, CT uh, coronary angiogram uh, in, in using in emergency setting as well. So the purpose of the, this lecture is, I'm not going to dive into deep uh, technical details. What I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a brief introduction of what we are doing when we do a calcium scoring or CT coronary angiogram. And I'm going to show you a few cases to demonstrate their utility in the uh, clinical uh, setting. So the learning, point, learning points will be, uh, so when we use CT coronary, angi coronary angiogram, we improve the risk stratification of future cardiac events because the CT coronary angiogram uh, give us the insight about the plaque morphology. And now we know the uh, plaques, uh, atherosclerotic plaques, uh, it, uh, we have the low risk plaques and vulnerable plaques. Uh, they, uh, according to the fibrous caps and the um, internal matter, uh, the vulnerability of each and every plaque varies, and uh, um, the luminal narrowing alone will not give us the information about the future risk of a particular uh, future risk of a plaque rupture in a particular plaque. So now we go for risk stratification beyond the luminal narrowing uh, assessment. And uh, the CT coronary angiogram is uh, having a high negative predictive value. So if the CT coronary angiogram in an appropriate risk uh, category becomes uh, uh, normal, then the patient doesn't need to undergo further cardiac uh, imaging tests. So other promising development in a CT coronary angiogram is uh, Calculation of a fractional flow reserve uh, from CT coronary angiogram, which is analogous to con conventional fractional flow reserve measurement. That means we measure the uh, pressure difference between the, uh, the in between the, that means uh, in the normal vessel as well as in the uh, post tenotic area in a stenosed vessel. And uh, then uh, we decide whether the particular stenosis is flow limiting or not. Usually, this was done using pressure guide wires in uh, angiograms, uh, in invasive angiograms, uh, which have which which have its uh, which which have uh, their own limitations. But uh, the CT fractional flow reserve is uh, kind of uh, mitigating most of the. Uh, limitations and uh, helping, uh, helping us to measure the uh, flow reserve in post tenotic vessel. So this image, what you see is a kind of in cardiac CT, uh, including CT coronary angiogram, uh, the, post the image processing after acquisition of image is very important. You know, we get axial images, helical axial images, and then computer process the image, uh, with uh, kind of a, because these coronary arteries are so tortuous and it is wrapped uh, in a three, uh, along a three dimensional organ, we have to use multiplanar reconstructions, curved planar reconstructions, so that we can see the coronary lumen and the plaque clearly. So we can risk stratify the plaque and we can uh, assess the luminal narrowing. And if we need, we can go for a bar. So uh, the other utilities of cardiac CT. Now in uh, coronary artery anomalies, this ECG gated CT coronary angiography is superior in sensitivity catheter angiography uh, because we can uh, see the coronary arteries, we can see the uh, anomalies and we can see how much it is affecting the uh, hemodynamics of uh, cardiac blood supply, and then we can do the surgical planning uh, by uh, taking all the measurements. Uh, then in uh, bypass patients, bypass patients, 
these um, uh, to bypass graft assessment after three years of bypass surgery. Uh, this cardiac CT plays a prominent role. We use a different protocol, but it plays a prominent role. And it helps us to assess the patency of the grafts. And if the patient has developed any complications, uh, we can see those complications due to the uh, after the CABG as well. Other one is triple rollout protocol with easy indicating. If the patient, if a patient comes with a chest pain, and if we suspect different causes such as pulmonary embolism, aortic thoracic, aortic dissection, or uh, uh, acute coronary syndrome, we can manipulate the protocol and contrast injections so that in one CT, we can see all three pathologies and we can exclude confidently if there are no such uh, killing pathologies in the patients. Very useful. So the basic thing we do, we do with cardiac CT, ECT-gated cardiac CT, is calcium scoring. We know the Agatson score. Uh, the principle we use here is the coronary arteries don't calcify with age. So we know the arteries, uh, they undergo a monkey calcification when, age, uh, when we age, but the coronary arteries, they don't... Uh, calcify uh, when we uh, become old. Uh, so that is very helpful. And uh, uh, we know the plaques calcify and uh, we can quantify the calcium and we can, uh, the, the studies have shown that by quantifying the calcium in the coronary arteries, we can risk stratify the patient. So we use a very low dose CT protocol here. The radiation dose is very low. We don't use contrast in this uh, calcium scoring uh, CT scan. And it is kind of a post-processing uh, technique which scores the calcium. So it helps us to uh, risk early risk, uh, helps us for early risk stratification. And uh, by treating those patients, uh, the uh, major adverse cardiac events uh, can be prevented in those uh, uh, individuals. So the guidelines or indications, uh, intermediate cardiovascular risk and asymptomatic adults, low to intermediate risk and asymptomatic adults, low risk and asymptomatic adults, asymptomatic adults with diabetic mel diabetes mellitus, 40 year, years of uh, age and older. So here we use, uh, we only take asymptomatic adults for this particular examination. And then we risk stratify these people. Now, if we take this fourth category, we know how many people in Sri Lanka have to undergo uh, the calcium scoring um, according to 2010 ACCM task force uh, guidelines. Now, this is a cross section of a processed uh, axial CT scan. Uh, you know, in CT scans, you don't see these uh, pink colors or whatever the can be. We get the uh, various shades of gray in CT scan. So the software has picked high uh, attenuating areas in the CT scan. You see the sternum; it is bone and it is high attenuation. That means that means it is uh, preventing the passage of uh, uh, X-ray beam through it. So it is a high attenuation uh, area and it picks. Uh, so we use the use uh, Hounsfield units to measure the attenuation. More than 90 Hounsfield units, this particular software picks. You see the bones are picked. And you see this is a, this is the left main stem, and this is LAD, and this is the LCX. I think you can see my cursor. So you see it has picked. High attenuation areas in the coronary artery. One is at the bifurcation, one is in the uh, left main stem, and the other one is in a lady, proximal lady. So these are the calcified plaques, and then it quantified. It quantified these plaques. So we have to pick those, we have to scroll the whole heart section, and vessel by vessel, we pick these uh, high attenuating plaques. And then we get a score for the vessel, and then we get then uh, we get a summation of score. And then uh, we have age and gender matched uh, reference values and uh, 
median, so we can risk stratify uh, uh, these patients uh, 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 according to the age and their gender. So that is the basic of a, a CT uh, calcium score. Uh, and if the patients uh, uh, have a, a calcium, uh, kind of the CT calcium scoring, it doesn't uh, quantify the non-calcified or soft plaques. It quantifies the calcified plaques alone. But we know that uh, uh, through uh, various reviews and researches, even the quantification of calci calcification in coronary artery and risk stratification according to the calcium uh, uh, calcified plaques are enough to predict the future cardiac event. Now we are we are moving to CT coronary angiogram in which we are going to use contrast injection. You see a CT scan machine and patient is lying on the gantry and his hand is elevated uh, above his head. This is the patient positioning we do for calcium scoring and CT coronary angiogram. Because if you keep the hands along his chest wall, what happens is the humeri and the uh, forearm bones attenuate the uh, X-ray beams so that the image generation will be of low quality and the study will be of limited sensitivity and specificity. So it is very important if we can't elevate the hands of the patient above his head, we can't take the patient for CT coronary angiogram or calcium scoring because the study won't be very useful. And uh, you know we have the machine factors. We have uh, we should have the uh, um, detectors uh, of uh, more than sixty four slices, um, and uh, the uh, the others. Then we should have ECG gating. That means the patient's ECG will be incorporated with the triggering of machine. So machine will recognize the various phases of ECG in the cardiac cycle and according to our pre-programmed uh, uh, decision, the machine will trigger according to particular phase of an ECG. Uh, so we should have an ECG uh, gating uh, software and uh, mechanism. Other one is a dual power injector. This is used for contrast injection. In CT coronary angiogram, we are going to use iodinated contrast, and then we are going to use a saline or saline mixed iodinated contrast on the other injector. So we will inject the iodinated, we shall inject the iodinated contrast, and uh, then there will be a saline chase or diluted contrast chase, which is going to uh, time the, uh, uh, which is going to optimally opacify the coronary arteries rather than the uh, ventricular cavities when we do the CT. So this is kind of a uh, technically tricky uh, procedure, and. Uh, ECG gating. Now we know the uh, uh, ECG uh, where we have P wave, QRX complex, and T wave. So uh, we are going to use uh, usually uh, we try to use uh, the diastolic cardiac diastolic phase so that the uh, coronary arteries can be imaged or can be. Uh, uh, if yes, can be imaged with minimum uh, uh, artifact. But individual coronary arteries experience significant motion artifacts during different cardiac spaces, uh, uh, phase. So what we do is uh, we have identified the uh, 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 phases in which particular coronary artery will be at uh, kind of rest and we will uh, we will experience less motion and we will use that particular uh, phase. We'll try to encompass, encompass all coronary arteries fitting into a phase where the motions will be minimum in all coronary arteries. So we'll come to that. So we have two types of uh, ECG kind of BBB. The main purpose of ECG gating is to minimize the uh, coronary artery mortality and to get the cardiac image, better cardiac image. And other thing is to by triggering the uh, CT during particular phase, 
we will be reducing a radiation dose. Now, worldwide, this cardiac CT has uh, become mainstay of a uh, uh, cardiac uh, uh, imaging and uh, screening of, uh, not screening, actually evaluation of low risk individuals. Uh, so we have to reduce the uh, radiation dose. So what we do is a, a protocol called prospectus. I'll show you, show you the images in the coming slides. So prospective uh, easy gating means kind of uh, the uh, CT machine will be radiating the patient and acquiring the images only in a particular phase of uh, cardiac cycle. During the rest of the phase, the machine won't be radiating the patients. So this prospective uh, triggering can be done in patients with stable sinus rhythm and a heart rate less than 70 beats per minute. So if we are going to have a rhythm of normalities or if the heart rate is going to be around 75 to 80, 85 range, then we have to use retrospective gating. Uh, that means the they are, they are the, the, car, the, the machine will be uh, taking a continuous helical imaging of uh, uh, the heart, irradiating in the whole cycle, giving more radiation to the patient. And then after acquiring the image, we will be selecting the faces. And then we will be reconstructing the coronary arteries in the particular phases. So this involves bit high radiation. So as I told you in retrospective uh, uh, triggering, the machine will be irradiating the face, uh, the patient throughout the whole uh, cycle. And then we will be, uh, in, in, in after acquisition of image, we will be kind of uh, processing the image at particular phase where we see minimum coronary um, uh, minimum motion artifacts in coronary arteries. Uh, so to select those phases, we will be going through all the axial section in various phases uh, after reconstruction, uh, reconstructing in many phases, and then we select one or two phases to evaluate uh, different coronary left and right coronary arteries. This is kind of a retrospective uh, that means the tissue the tube is going to irradiate the patient, but what will happen is that the tube can't will be modulated. So we will select a particular phase, guessing that during the particular phase, we are going to get most satisfactory images. So what happens is uh, beyond the particular phase, the tube current will be so low. So the radiation beyond the particular uh, uh, phases will be low to the patient. Other one is the prospective, uh, prospective triggering, or we call it step and shoot. Because what happens is the machine will be uh, will not be irradiating the patient uh, beyond the particular phase we have selected. So this is very low uh, dose protocol that is prospective. So as I told you, each artery will suffer from motion artifact at different phases, and uh, uh, the following intervals are the best windows to prevent movement for different arteries. Right coronary artery, it is at the 40% of RR interval. I will show you what, that, what does that mean. Left uh, anterior descending branch, it is 6 to 70% of RR interval. This means this is at the systolic phase. This is at the diastolic phase. LCX, that is 50 to 60% of RR interval. So LAD and L, uh, LC, that is left circumflex coronary artery. So this, this is uh, best seen at the uh, end diastolic phase. And the right coronary artery is best seen at systolic phase. But if we have prepared the patient well, controlled the heart rate, and we have done the rhythm control, that means uh, we can use the diastolic phase even to see the right coronary artery. And it is easy for us uh, to use one phase. So now, we, uh, usually what we do is we do a prospective gating around 75% uh, at the 75% of the cardiac cycle. Uh, that is, uh, that will be uh, kind of demonstrating at the left coronary artery very nicely. 
And if the heart rate is a bit high, the right coronary artery usually suffers a bit more motion. And uh, if we feel the right coronary arteries uh, are going to be tricky, then we will be using a systolic phase that is 30 to 40 percent to during which time the machine will be uh, irradiating the patient uh, and accurate payment. So we are going to use drugs to uh, uh, rate control. One is metoprolol. So this is a beta blocker. If the patient's heart, resting heart rate is more than 70, we'll be giving uh, metoprolol. Uh, the dosage uh, can be either uh, 50 milligram oral metoprolol, 12 hours before exam, before the scan, and one hour before scan, so two doses. Or if you are going to give a stat dose, we can give 50 to 100 milligram of metoprolol one hour before scan. We have to exclude the contraindications to metoprolol. You know, severe asthma. Uh, uh, if the patient is on verapamil, that is contraindicated. Severe aortic stenosis, restrictive physiology in lungs, and second and third degree heart failure. We can use metoprolol. In asthma patients, after discussion with the cardiologist, we use uh, ivabradine, which is a calcium channel blocker. Ivabradine, uh, either we can give 5 milligram BD for three days, or we can use 15 milligram ivabradine two hours before scan. Uh, even with the oral medication, if uh, uh, the uh, heart rate is not adequately controlled for various reasons, what we do is actually after patient arrives to the department, we measure the heart rate and the blood pressure, and we try to talk to the we try to pull down the patient, we try to relax the patient, which is very important. So we should have trained nurses and uh, the persons of a, a cardiac imaging consultant, a cardiac radiologist, and uh, or cardiac imaging consultant in the uh, scan room, so that he can reassure the patient because this is going to be a uh, it's not going to be like a normal CT uh, because you are going to, so we reassure the patient and then we train the patient for breath holding because the breath holding is very important to minimize the motion artifact. And during the breath holding, patient will be experiencing a sort of a, a reduction in heart rate. So after giving that pre medication, if the patient comes with 75 uh, beats per minute, and uh, after relax, uh, relax, after uh, reassuring the patient and with breath hold, sometimes the heart rate may go down to 68 or 65 beats per minute, and we can proceed with the cardiac CT. Uh, if the if the beats are, if the heart rate is not controlled with the oral medication alone, we can use uh, IV metoprolol uh, uh, in the when the patient is in the entry. Uh, so IV metoprolol is a kind of a uh, what we do is we monitor the blood pressure on the gantry and we monitor the uh, heart rate in the gantry and we give 5 milligram of IV metoprolol, slow IV injection, followed by a saline flush. And then we may wait for three minutes, assess the heart rate, assess the blood pressure again. Then we go for another 5 milligram until we get the desired heart rate. The highest dose you can give is. 20 milligrams in some centers they go up to 30 milligrams but it is tricky. Other thing is pre-medication with the sublingual GTN. So uh, glycerol trinitrate we know that it uh, dilates the coronary arteries but it gives headache. If the patient is not having a contraindication I used to give sublingual uh, uh, nitrate because it nicely demonstrates the coronary artery even to the periphery even to the most distal aspect of the coronary artery. So when the patient is on the gantry, we uh, actually reassure, we tell him that he may get a headache and we spray the sublingual GTN. And then we wait for three to four minutes because the maximum action uh, is at six minutes. So we wait for three to uh, four minutes and we start the uh, contrast injection. So then it takes another two minutes and we, 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 we take the CT scan. So the contraindication for GTN, Sylvana can use uh, or any other phosphorylesterase inhibitors, CBI aortic stenosis, or uh, systolic blood, blood pressure less than 90 uh, millimeters. Now, then once you get the cardiac CT, uh, you get the axial sections of uh, CT, the CT 
scan which is focused on heart and uh, with the axial sections what you do is you do reconstructions of heart cardiac chambers in various planes we get the echo echo images in ct and then we go for the uh, multiplanar reconstruction and you see these cross sections of coronary artery that is kind of a vessel we call it vessel walk you go walk through the lumen you see the plug you see the stenosis and you quantify the um, uh, you quantify and uh, the, 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 the luminal, uh, luminal narrowing and stratify the plug. So indication non-invasive evaluation of coronary artery anomalies and other thoracic vessels, that is for CTCA. Um, symptomatic patients with low or moderate probability of coronary artery disease, that means normal or uninterpretable non-diagnostic ECD in a patient with chest pain, normal low equivocal cardiac biomarkers, moderate risk non-acute symptomatic patients without known heart disease. Uh, who may be who may be able to exercise or may not be able to exercise. So low risk, non-acute asymptomatic patients without known heart disease, the patient cannot exercise or undergo stress test. So if we are going to evaluate a patient for CABG, we can even see the uh, lima that is uh, uh, inferior intramammary arteries, so that uh, we can uh, even uh, mark the. Uh, in, in uh, intramammary arteries uh, so that they can cultivate it for the bypass graft. If the patient is uh, uh, having a heart failure, which is new onset monetary history of uh, coronary artery disease, low to intermediate probability. Decrease rejection fraction. Then preoperative assessment of coronary arteries before non-coronary uh, uh, cardiac surgery if intermediate risk of coronary artery disease. Uh, discordant ECG and imaging results after stress imaging. New or worsening symptoms with past normal stress imaging studies. Preoperative assessment for, you know, this percutaneous aortic valve replacement. So now we are moving for cases. 59-year-old uh, woman was followed up by cardiology as an outpatient following ablation of an AME nodal re-entry tachycardia. Her symptoms, which include chest pain, and resolved ablation, a CT coronary angiogram uh, was arranged to rule out CAD. Now, this is the CT coronary angiogram. What you see is uh, kind of a abnormality in the left hand. You know, you cannot pick one vessel disease in this particular reconstruction. These are labeled by the uh, computer, and because we do the reconstructions, the one who is doing the reconstruction know what vessel it is. So don't worry about. Uh, a kind of, a, but if you can guess that this is uh, left ventricle, you know this, this is a lady. So this is a peculiar type of plaque. This is not kind of a dark plaque with the uh, fat or kind of a plaque with calcification. Now, if you see a uh, characteristic indicates vulnerability of that plaque, even though the uh, luminal narrowing was minimal. So after 15 months of the identification of uh, this particular plaque, patient was put on medical therapy, but unfortunately patient attended to emergency department uh, with T inversions and uh, uh, positive troponin uh, and, uh, and uh, treatment was started for non stemming Then she had an urgent PCI for a lady lesion. So you see, this is the angiogram uh, of the particular patient and now uh, this is RT after angioplasty. So, what is a vulnerable plaque? So, vulnerable or high risk plaque refers to coronary artery atherosclerotic lesions with features associated with future acute coronary events independent of luminal stenosis. And you have a vulnerable, there is something called napkin ring sign that, that is kind of you get a necrotic co fibrotic. Uh, fibrous fatty plaque and then fibrotic capsule, you get the internal, 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 you see this coronary artery. This is the coronary artery. You see a rim, napkin rim, a high attenuating rim, a rim. Otherwise, this should be of this kind of dark area. Now, this has a high attenuating area that shows this, this is a vulnerable plaque. 
Now, this is another characteristic of a vulnerable plaque. Now, you see, this is a plaque. And this plaque is bit down. And if you measure the AQ value of this plaque, you know, this causes some kind of a even significant luminal narrowing, kind of a moderate luminal narrowing. But this is an isolated plaque. But if you measure the AQ, that means the attenuation value, that will be around 30. That means this is a fat rich plaque which is vulnerable. So less than 30 AQ in CT angiogram is vulnerable. Then something is called a positive remodeling. Then this is the coronary artery. You, you are getting a plaque here. This is a fat, uh, this is a non calcified plaque, but you, you don't see such kind of a low attenuation fat. But to the size of this plaque, you don't see that much of luminal narrowing. This, go, this was actually mild narrowing, if I say. Um, uh, and if you see the outline of this coronary artery, the vessel wall, has undergone a positive remodeling. It has enlarged to accommodate this plant. That means this is a vulnerable plant. Though this is not causing a luminal narrowing at this point, this patient will be presenting with uh, uh, acute coronary syndrome later on. This is a image defining risk factor. And this tiny spotty calcifications again indicate vulnerable plant. You see, these are tiny spotty, not chunky calcification. That should be less than three millimeter in size. This is a second case, a uh, 28 year old lady, this is a pretty young lady with angina class two, which is uh, not usual, exertional dyspnea, now, no risk factor for ischemic heart disease, ECG, Q um, uh, plus T inversion, ABL L1, biphasic TV to, to V4 to V5, T inversion V6. So mild S elevation V3 to V4, uh, mild reduced cell function, so she underwent CTCA. Now, if you see clearly, this is iota and this is pulmonary artery. So if you can guess, now this is pulmonary artery, you know, common pulmonary plant. What you see is origin of left main stem uh, of left coronary artery is from the pulmonary artery. How do you call this an origin? This is called alkappa, anomalous origin of left uh, coronary artery from pulmonary artery. So we have two types. Now you can see it clear. You know this is the pulmonary artery. Now we are moving to pulmonary, pulmonary anomalies. So he is getting an anomalous origin from uh, pulmonary artery. So we have two types. One is infantile. What happens is uh, um, uh, uh, during the first month of life, uh, the due to the pulmonary Hypertension, the patient will be made, the child will be maintaining cardiac perfusion because there, there will be a bit more, more oxygenation in pulmonary artery blood as well. But uh, subsequently, the pair, gradually, the pulmonary resistance will uh, be low and the pulmonary uh, artery oxygen content will be low. So the patient will be developing ischemia and then patient, the child will be, uh, the, 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 the neonate will be kind of dying. So some people, what happens is they develop during this period of life. So now this is 3D reconstruction. This is iota, this is pulmonary artery. You see nicely uh, arising left main stem from the pulmonary artery and giving rise to LCX and LAB. So what happens is then we know there are collateral circulations between uh, coronary arteries. So the collaterals will open up in the patients who are surviving and the left, sorry, right coronary artery, which is having normal oxygen, will be supplying the areas where the left coronary artery uh, have to supply. And the left coronary artery will be getting that blood and draining into the pulmonary circulation. Uh, so during 20s, uh, during the 30s, these patients also will develop ischemia and these paper patients will be developing arrhythmias as well. You see these tiny, these, you see these are the collateral vessels. These are the collateral vessels supplying, uh, uh, they are going through, they are going, they are supplying blood from the right coronary arteries. So the other case, again, 40 year old lady presented with unstable angina and exertion and dyspnea. The dyspnea, normal uh, LV function, she had dyslipidemia and other risk factors. She was referred to CTCA. Now I'm going to play this video. Uh, 
it fast because we have limited time. These are axial sections. Now you see, this is aorta, this is pulmonary artery. This is aorta, this is pulmonary artery. Uh, yeah, now you are getting, I'm scrolling it. And you are getting the pulmonary artery, right pulmonary artery, left pulmonary artery, common pulmonary artery. You see here, large vessel here. So what is going to happen, this large vessel, it is very tortuous, and you see one large vessel is draining into again into the pulmonary trunk. But you see the left main trunk is arising from the uh, uh, um, iota. And what is going to happen if you go along with this study? Now, if you see this vessel, trace this vessel, this is going into the interventricular area. So that is LA. This is an anomalous origin of left anterior descending artery from uh, pulmonary artery, not the whole left coronary artery. So this is extremely rare phenomenon. We, uh, we had a case in the teaching hospital in Rutherford. So the patient uh, uh, yeah, developed uh, angina and uh, she, her uh, kind of LAD territory was kind of ischemic at that time. You can see dilated tortuous vessel. You see, this whitishness can be seen into this uh, dark pulmonary artery. That means it is uh, it is uh, actually shunting the flow into the pulmonary artery rather than supplying the heart. You see here, nicely depicted in 3D. So coronary artery anomalies constitute a diverse group of abnormalities ranging from anatomical variants and having hemodynamic to those having hemodynamic consequences. So you know the list. I'm going to skip that because we can read it. Uh, so CTCF provides elegant depiction of coronary artery anatomy and the relationship of the vessel to the adjacent to the adjacent structures with the ability to perform three-dimensional reconstruction and surgical plan. Case four: 60-year-old woman with hypertension dyslipidemia. She already under peripheral artery disease underwent CAVG. She uh, used lima, that means left in internal memory artery graft to left anterior descending artery presented with uh, chest pain to the emergency department. So chest pain addressed uh, and paresthesis of left hand. This is pretty uncommon. There, is, there was ST segment elevations was immediately taken to uh, percutaneous coronary intervention. Uh, so this is a nice case that I wanted to show it to you. Now if you see now, this is the injection at the uh, left uh, main uh, uh, stem. It shows nice opacification. You can see the clips. And what you see here is the lima graft. This is the graft. And when you inject, you see the graft is patent. This is the lima graft. You see, this is the sternotomy wires, and these are the staplers stabilizing the uh, lima graft. So, the, uh, the, the, what is the cause of this? Um, um, ischemia because the graft was patent and uh, uh, we can see the left main stem injection nicely opacified the graft as well as the uh, coronary artery. Now, you see, we are doing an aortic injection. We are the, if you, if you can do it again, you see the brachiocephalic, right? Brachiocephalic tongue is opacified, but we don't see the right, uh, sorry, left uh, subclavian artery. What is happening to left subclavian artery? So now again we are doing this coronary injection. So now this is a CT um, iotogram with 3D reconstruction. Now you see this left subclavian artery is not continuous from the iota because there is a obstructing plaque at the uh, origin of subclavian artery. So what happens is actually subclavian artery is supplied by the lima graft rather than subclavian artery supplying the heart. So the coronary, the, 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 the blood coming through the stenosis is shunted to the subclavian artery and hand. So what is a coronary subclavian steel syndrome? This is called coronary subclavian steel syndrome in uh, lima grafted patients. What happens is because of the subclavian artery stenosis at its uh, commencement, you get the blood shunted through lima to subclavian artery. 
these of you may not going to skip because of the time limitations. Uh, because probably, yeah, we yeah, have right close to the uh, So, CRB, so those are the images where yeah, the graphs were nicely demonstrated. We can see whether the graphs are patent or we can see whether they have to undergo into some sort of uh, angioplasty or other interventions. What we do is uh, we do a cardiac CT, 70 to 80 percent of RR interval, exclusively during ventricular diastole. So it, it should be done during breath hold, and we have to include uh, from the thoracic inlet to the, the base of the heart. And others are technical details, which you, all, which you know. Probably, yes. Other one is triple rollout cardiac CT. So in acute chest pain, uh, we were using, we have been using triple rollout in centers where we have, where we have access to an emergency CT facility, where the CT scan is separately dedicated for emergency department, and we have uh, the imaging specialist there. So what we do is we try to exclude acute coronary syndrome, pulmonary embolism, and acute uh, aortic syndrome. That means uh, the aortic dissection and uh, things in, in uh, uh, one CT scan. So to opacify both coronary and pulmonary arteries, we use biphasic injection technique. So we give contrast in two both phases, 80 milliliter of undiluted contrast when injected, 5 milliliter per second flowed by 25 milliliter of same contrast diluted with 25 milliliter normal saline at 5 milliliter per second. So we use bolus tracking, I think, for uh, radiologists here, you need to know, for cardiac imaging people, you need to know bolus tracking means the, the, the machine will be tracking at a predetermined point in a blood vessel, uh, the attenuation, and when the machine feels the contrast has come adequately, machine will start getting the acquisition of images. So it is a prospective ECG trigger, and it's not pressure. So from the inferior margin to the clavicle of the heart. So this is the protocol, this is technical, you know. Now, now you see this is an aortic dissection. This is a patient admitted to EE. And uh, now if you can see this, um, uh, uh, this particular, this coronary sinus, actually this origin of this particular coronary artery is actually involved in the dissection. So this is going to impair the blood flow of uh, the coronary artery. And patient may present with ischemia. Another patient, acute chest pain, uh, and uh, his uh, iota was normal, but he had uh, this kind of fungi calcifications and uh, a long tandem lesion in the and tandem lesions means uh, kind of a uh, that means uh, the plaques along uh, or particular when you get the flowing uh, the, the plaques in the coronary artery. And you see, this is myocardium. This is very nicely enhanced whitish myocardium. And this is the endocardium. You can see subendocardial hypo enhancement or low enhancement, which indicates subendocardial ischemia. I'm sorry, probably. Now we are going into fractional flow reserve. This is relatively new uh, 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 coming for the coronary CT coronary angiogram. So this is a hope, this is a promise in the field. Um, we can assess the hemodynamic significance of a lesion by comparison of the pressure, pressure distal to the stenosis to the aortic pressure. Now, uh, in conventional uh, uh, fractional flow reserve measurements using the uh, conventional angiogram, invasive angiograms, what we use is we insert the pressure measurement guide wire to the iota. We measure the blood, uh, sorry, the pressure in the iota. Uh, before uh, at the uh, and then we measure the pressure distal to a plaque and then we see uh, the kind of a, uh, we see the uh, difference. So we have to measure this at maximal hyperemia because at that point only the arterial resistance is equalized and coronary blood flow will be proportional to the pressure. Otherwise, the reading will be wrong. So we have to use adenosine in, 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 in the invasive coronary angiogram. 
Other one is the uh, we need partial monitoring by wire. So we have to pass distal stenosis. If it is going to be tricky, then uh, that is uh, that would be helpful. So ratio of distal to proximal values determining uh, it, it will determine FFR. So it is given in a kind of point. Uh, if the ratio is more than 0.8, then that means the uh, plug doesn't limit the flow uh, significantly. If it is less than 0.75, the limitation is significant. The patient may be uh, undergoing a percutaneous intervention after going through the CT uh, coronary angiogram and the plug characteristic, or the patient may be, um, uh, if it is between 0.75 to 0.8, then individual case basis will be uh, selecting cases for intervention and uh, uh, medical management. Uh, the advantage is we don't need to do a separate CT4 to assess FFR. We can use the CT coronary angiogram raw data to compute. It is a kind of a computation. So we use it for uh, the, uh, the, the, the CT coronary angiogram uh, raw data to um, uh, as a, access this data. And uh, the advantage is we don't need to administer adenosine for CT because even the computer modifies, uh, the, the computer can model the CTCA and it can simulate the raw data uh, in a way uh, that uh, equivalent to adenosine administration. And other thing is allows modification of the coronary flow model to eliminate an ischemia causing stenosis. <coughs> Thus, enabling virtual stenting of coronal lesion. Now, this is the end result of a FFRCT. This is IOTA. You see various uh, colors in this uh, coronary artery. This is color mapping. So it ranges from blue, then it comes to uh, green, uh, then it comes to yellow, then it comes to red, and then it becomes dark when it is. Uh, an obstructing lesion. That means when the uh, uh, pressure difference is significant, the color turns into red and then it, uh, it becomes dark. And the advantage is when you move the cursor along this generated image, it's not fine, this is a photo. So you can get FFR. If I put the cursor in the particular software, I can get FFR, uh, sorry, um, uh, the FFR here. If I have put uh, something here, the cursor here, then we can get FFR here. So along the coronary artery, you can get FFR. And if this is the stenosis, you see, this is the stenosis area. Beyond that, even you can pick with your eyes because this becomes red here. So FFR is nine, uh, 0.92, two centimeter before, uh, two centimeter proximal to the stenosis and two centimeter distal, it is 0.73. As I mentioned you, this is significant. And you can calculate the difference that is delta FFR, that if it is more than 0.12, that becomes significant again. So it's quite uh, easy, but this technique is quite expensive. And you can virtually stent this lesion in the particular software. And that simulates stenting, and that will show how that is going to improve the FFR in the distal vessel. And then you can decide whether the stenting is going to help in this particular vessel. So it is, it gives lesion specific ischemia, it, 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 it shows the lesion specific ischemia and kind of virtual study. So um, virtual setting resulting in recalculation of coronary blood flow and FFRCT can predict hemodynamic effect of uh, coronary, uh, coronary study in a lesion specific manner. So the software currently used is hard flow. We need a supercomputer or advanced computer. We can use very, we can, we can do advanced calculations of physics. And uh, we don't have such computer uh, in Sri Lanka, even in UK. What we used to do is we send it to the original hard flow developer in California. And within two days, they send us this map and result, and then we um, uh, use uh, that data. It takes a bit, it costs around 600 Australian pounds. Now they are trying to find different ways to circumvent this uh, tricky calculation so that our computers can adapt uh, 
uh, we, we can be used to uh, kind of create these models. And FFRCD, it should be measured much with the genotic region, and it correlates best with the region specific genia. And this is a case interpretation of FFRCD results in a city by the old woman. She take Langina. This is calcium scoring score 333, which is quite significant. Now, you see, we don't interpret FFRCD in isolation. We interpret FFRCT with the CT coronary angiogram. We do the plug, plug morphology. We locate the lesion where it is. Now, you see, this is the lesion. You have, we do have calcifications here. And what happens here is you have um, uh, now you have uh, uh, 0.92 at the proximal this area uh, 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 FFRCT value, and here 0.85. This is so. Though in the image it shows a significant luminal narrowing, FFRCT demonstrate that this is not hemodynamically significant, so the lesion specific ischemia is less, so it can be treated um, uh, conservatively. <clears throat> now, this is another case. So, this is a curved MPR coronary artery. And axial reconstruction, you can see coronary artery calcification. 66 year old patient, atypical chest pain. If you see this artery, it gives kind of a moderate um, uh, moderate stenosis. But if you see the FFRCT, you can see you know, distal to the stenosis still is uh, this is FFR where the CT value is 0.87. So medical therapy was started, it was not introduced. So this again, curved planar reconstruction. Uh, uh, 64 year old man with stable chest pain, moderate stenosis. FFRCT shows uh, FFR value so two centimeter distal. Now, if you see this, um, uh, the stenotic lesion, the value is less than 0.5, less than 0.5. Though this is significant, he has to undergo. Uh, you can see the angiogram, uh, it is causing significant flow limitation. This patient has to undergo uh, uh, stenting. He underwent stenting. So now if you take a multi-vessel disease, you can determine which vessels or which stenosis need intervention and which stenosis can be dealt with uh, uh, medical therapy. So because this gives you the um, uh, freedom of uh, simulating re, uh, what is it, uh, stenting, you can do that and you can see. Now you see, so there are in LAD, left anterior descending branch, you have stenosis here, and then LCX, you have a stenosis, then RCA, you have a stenosis. And now if you see the FFRCT, now right coronary artery is not much, the, the, the flow in right coronary artery is not much affected, so the lesion specific ischemia is not significant. Uh, now uh, uh, the LCX and LAD, you see the red color, and the FFRCT is 0.72 and 0.71, which is significant. Uh, so patient underwent uh, invasive coronary angiogram to revascularization of these two vessels and this was, uh, this, these two stenosis, the flux, uh, this stenosis was left behind. <clears throat> now, this is gradual disease of FFR values. Now, you see, you see this right coronary artery is predominantly uh, bluish in color. Now here, there is the stenosis here. From here, what you get is a kind of a gradual reduction in FFR value, which becomes significant, quite significant, this value. You have a plaque here, um, uh, but it is not causing uh, significant stenosis in this area. But we get a gradual reduction, and it was presumed that this gradual re reduction was due to diffuse uh, atherosclerotic disease. But there was no focal stenosis which can be intervened to mitigate this sort of uh, phenomenon sort of a, 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 a hemodynamic issue. So this patient received medical therapy because there's no form, uh, kind of, even in, even in simulation, this particular um, standing of this area didn't show a significant uh, improvement in this case. So, so uh, sorry, uh, I have to apologize because uh, there was an issue with the covering. Um, and I think I can hear you. Um, so that is the end of the session. Take home messages. Cardiac imaging is a 
becoming a mainstay in cardiac evaluation and then CT coronary angiogram uh, is an emerging uh, and is giving a lot of promises, not like in all, in all time, as I have told you earlier, now we are getting uh, fantastic uh, outcomes, even in evaluation of acute uh, chest pain patients. Uh, so fortunately in Sri Lanka, so we hope that in Sri Lanka also we get these facilities because most of the centers in Sri Lanka, they have the CT machine capacities. They have more than 60 fossilized CTs. What they need is, they need a liver head injector, they need cardiac software, they need ECG gating, and they need trained personnel, uh, trained radiologists and radiographers and nurses to give these facilities. Because you know the number one killer in Sri Lanka, I think number two killer in Sri Lanka is the uh, uh, ischemic heart disease questions. I don't know if I have time for questions, but yeah, uh, thank you so much, sir, uh, uh, for that uh, informative and wonderful lecture. So many technical aspects explored, but beautifully presented. We have got a few questions coming our way, sir. I'm sure most of them were covered in the lecture, but uh, for further clarification, sir. Uh, the first question is preparation of CKD, preparation of a CKD patient for CACT when indicated. Yeah, of course. Um, yeah, this is a general question. Uh, thank you. Um, actually, uh, what we do is, um, uh, in 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 circumstances where we can avoid contrast in, uh, injection, and if we can get the needed information from non-contrast CT, we proceed with the non-contrast CT. If the contrast CT should be done to save the life, then what we do is actually we have the EGFR. If it is less than thirty, that is significant. We can't proceed. But if the EGFR is not less than 30, we can hydrate the patient and we can go for contrast injection. We can limit the contrast volume uh, and we can do contrast injection. And then after uh, CT also, we can hydrate the patient and we can uh, observe the serum creatinine level and if needed, the patient can undergo hemodialysis. So that is how it should be managed. If the patient is on metformin, there are various guidelines. We stop metformin. Nowadays, kind of metformin stopping is also you know, kind of very famous. Uh, but mainly, uh, contrast is quite safe. The problem is the managing of emergency in Sri Lankan setup and managing of kind of uh, um, contrast induced uh, nephropathy or um, uh, nephropathy in, in the hospitals uh, where the patient may be retransferred. Kind of the patient is from my hospital, Mulati, coming to uh, somewhere else to do a CT, and if the patient comes with the contrast induced nephropathy, it's going to be quite tricky, then we have to, so the various factors involved, but basically you can do a contrast CT if the EGV, EGFR is uh, not less than 30. Uh, Thank you so much, sir. Well answered. So the next question is, currently, where are these facilities available in Sri Lanka for CTC? Yeah, and rather for actually, I and rather for was doing well. So then uh, after I returned from overseas training, we freshly started the CT coronary angiogram. So you can, I think you can get it done in Amradhapura, NHSL, uh, and Ratnapura, I think. Um, other centers actually are, uh, I am not familiar with, but these three centers in Amradhapura, we were accepting requests from all around the country. So feel free to call these three centers. So in Amradhapura, we have a, a request, separate request form for cardiac CT. Talk with the radiologist there, get the CT form, fill it, and get the appointment uh, and get the CT done. Because we have to utilize clinicians and we all have to utilize these facilities so that the radiologists and cardiac imaging consultants will become more familiar with these techniques. They will they, they also become kind of it's kind of by doing to learn the technique. There will be pitfalls, even if there may be kind of errors in reporting uh, in the initial initial state. Don't worry, but you do it, and then kind of you learn from your mistakes. You can get these facilities from Ratna I think uh, I think the radiologist you have to clarify from it uh, from the radiologist NHSL definitely and uh, uh, and rather teaching hospital and all. Okay, thank you, sir. So uh, we got another question, sir. Uh, dear sir, you mentioned the guidelines for screening, which included many, but practically, which ones are really needed? Pardon? Uh, dear sir, you mentioned the guidelines for screening, which included yes. many, yes. Uh, but practically, which ones are really needed? Which ones are the which ones are more important? Practically. Yeah. Uh, 
um, actually, uh, the guidelines for screening, that is a quite uh, <laughs> tricky wording. Even in UK, because of the uh, cost effectiveness and uh, less number of cardiac imaging consultants or cardiac radiologists, still we haven't gone for uh, kind of screening cardiac CT angiogram or um, cardiac CT angiogram uh, uh, in patients. But calcium scoring, I think the main thing, the, the important aspect is that diabetes above 40 years. If the patient, if the particular individual have developed diabetes quite young age, and now he's having, a, he's beyond 40 years, there is a high risk of uh, coronary artery disease in the particular patient. So by doing calcium scoring, you can see the uh, coronary, you can uh, kind of see the burden of coronary artery disease, and if necessary, you can go, go for CTCA. And the, with the patients with stable or atypical chest pain, with low to intermediate risk, you know, risk stratification of coronary, uh, the chest pain, coronary artery disease, there are various scoring systems. You can select those patients as well. Another thing, the patients with erectile dysfunction, the cause may be due to the dorsal penile artery atherosclerotic plant. So sometimes these patients come for ultrasound for erectile dysfunction, and you may find a, a penile artery. Uh, Plant. It is highly associated with coronary artery. So, diabetes, more than 40 years, erectile dysfunction, if it is not due to psychological causes, so you can simply rule out psychological causes. If the patient is not having early morning erection, that means it's going to be a pathology. You can go for at least, at least calcium scoring in those patients. Okay. Uh, young patients, atypical uh, chest pain, uh, tricky, you can go for those patients. And if you want a triple rule out in acute scenarios, you can go to triple rule out studies. Very well, sir. Well answered. Thank you so much, sir. And uh, since due to the uh, time constraints, sir, we have so many questions, but we'll wind up here. So once again, we would like to extend our heartfelt gratitude for your precious time and the wonderful lecture given. And uh, we also would like to thank all the participants for having a patient's uh, hearing uh, uh, until now. And uh, yeah, sir, and uh, please do find the link for the e-certificate in the chat functions. Uh, so until we see you again in another CPD webinar program, thank you so much and have a good day. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Shri uh, uh, Knowledge Academy and uh, Dr. Vasan Ravna Singham who involved me in this uh, uh, lecture. Uh, actually, I am happy to support you if you are uh, trying to develop cardiac CT in your centers or if you are trying to send patients for some cardiac CT. Even I'm happy to report cardiac CTs. Unfortunately, our laptop systems and higher softwares won't help us to report. So if you have issues, uh, uh, if you need some sort of support, uh, I think uh, Faslan can share my WhatsApp number, no problem, because these are professionals, or even email address, I'll be happy to respond to you. Thank you very much, thank you.